All right. Well, I know we are a few minutes early, um, but I found out in my meeting that I have even less time than I thought. So I only have until three o'clock um, to lecture anyway. So I thought we would go ahead and get started here. And um, anybody who's still still uh, making their way in here can check the recording for anything they may miss. But you guys know I don't tend to start my lectures off that quickly anyway. So um, let's go ahead and get going. Um, we're not. I'm going to skip fun fun quiz questions in the interest of time today. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about periodic trends um, because that's going to allow you to answer a few of your um, few of the uh, homework questions today, um, and then we're, and that includes um, counting valence electrons and atomic radius. And I should suppose I should add in there um, ionization energy um, are some some properties of elements that we can actually predict based on how we understand um, how we can understand how electrons work. Uh, and and orbitals, and then we'll get into moles and atomic mass, um, and using the atomic mass on the periodic table to to calculate things like the number of atoms or number of molecules in a system. Uh, and then finally, we'll end talking about um, isotopic masses, which is basically the the way we calculate the atomic masses that you see on the periodic table um, are not just the weight of the most common isotope it's basically the average weight if you took a, a whole bunch of atoms of all of the isotopes that are present on earth and took the average mass of all of those atoms as opposed to just looking at one specific isotope there are a few elements um on the periodic table that are only found in nature in one specific isotope um but there are other other elements that are found frequently in multiple different isotopes. So that what the ma the mass on the periodic table is actually showing you um, is the average mass of an atom. If you combined all of the isotopes you're likely to find and the amount the probabilities that you find a specific isotope. So we'll talk about how we can do some calculations with that um, today as well. All right, so we ended up talking about electron configuration the other day, and we went with the, the general approach for electron configuration um, is that we're looking for the, we're going to follow the periodic table and use the row and the block on the periodic table to help us determine how many electrons can go into what types of orbitals. And right, so for if we wanted to, to uh, write the, we did the electron configuration for oxygen and sulfur the other day, but let's go ahead and do argon um, as, a, as a practice here. Um, so if we're trying to write the electron configuration of argon, uh, let me pull up my periodic table real quick as well. This is the one I want. Um, that one that'll do so if we're trying to write the electron configuration for argon ar over here number atomic number 18 if it's a neutral atom it's got the same number of electrons as the as the atomic number right atomic number is your number of protons and if it's neutral that means you also have that same number of electrons so if we wanted to write the, um, the electron configuration for argon, we start by counting it hydrogen. So I'm just going to type it at the top here. Um, we start on row one, on energy level one. And hydrogen belongs in the S block. So we're putting electrons into an S orbital. And an S orbital can hold a total of two electrons. That's why it's two elements across the S block. Remember that the blocks are um, labeled at the bottom here. And if you wanted to 
um, draw lines for each of the blocks. The S block is to the left of that line. The P block is to the right of that line. And the D block is in between. And then the, those elements along the bottom um, are actually the um, we're no, what's known as the F block. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So if we wanted to write argon, argon's electron configuration, we start with the first energy level, putting electrons into an S orbital. And the S orbital can hold two electrons. So we do a superscript two. And that's not really saying squared. That's just in the number of electrons in that second energy level, or sorry, in that um, S orbital. Then we finish with the first row of the periodic table. So we finished the first energy level. So now we're on the second energy level, and we're still in the, we're counting along with lithium over here. So we're still in the S block. And again, the S block can hold a total of two electrons. So we start with one S2, then two S2. And we keep counting. And now we're in, over here in boron in the P block. So we're still the second row of the periodic table. We're now in a P orbital. And a P orbital can hold up to six electrons, which is why it's six elements across. And remember, we're just trying to go until we get to a total of 18 electrons. So we're just trying to count until we get to argon. So 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. Now we're finished with the second row of the periodic table. So we go three, and we're back over here by in sodium and magnesium. So we're back in the S block, and it can hold two electrons. Now we're finally getting to the section that has argon in it. We're still in the third energy level. It's still, uh, now we're in the P orbital. And in order to get all the way to argon, we need to get to that full P orbital. So we need a total of six electrons in this P orbital here. So our full electron configuration for argon would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. And again, these are always going to go in the same order. So you can always follow along with the periodic table and just count along with it. Once you remember how to, um, how to pay attention to what block you're in and what row you're in, that's all there is to it, really. All right, so let's do one more. Um, let's see. Let's do aluminum for now. So aluminum is going to look very similar to argon, right? Because the first, the first two energy levels are the same, right? So it's still going to be. for aluminum, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. That gets us to the first two rows of the periodic table. We're trying to get to aluminum, which has 13 electrons, and we've just put in 10 electrons. So we need three more electrons. So we're now in the third row of the periodic table. So three, and we're in the S block. They can hold two electrons. Now we need a total of one more electron to get to aluminum. So still third energy level. It's still in the P block. But now instead of putting all six electrons into the P block, we're only going to put one electron. So it becomes 3P1. All right, so these really don't get tricky at all until you get past the third row of the periodic table. Once you know the pattern that it goes in and then you can follow along the periodic table, it's always the same um, until we get to a d orbital. D orbitals are where things get weird. So if we look at Let's see, I don't have that, um, that table of, um, 
of uh, orbital energies. Um, but when you go, once you finish the third row of the periodic table, it winds up that you, you put, start putting electrons into the fourth energy level, even though technically we're not done filling up the third energy level yet. The first d orbital, which say the, the elements that are in this first row of the periodic of the uh, d block, they actually, you're technically putting electrons into the 3d orbital when you're adding electrons here. But because the 3d orbital is actually higher in energy than 4s, we do 4s first. And then this, this um, section, this first d orbital, we kind of go backwards. So if we wanted to write the electron configuration for zinc, um, everything would be the same until we got to argon. So we could, for zinc, it's still going to be 1s, 2, 2s, 2, 2p, 6, 3s, 2, 3p, 6. <clears throat> and now we're, we finished the third row of the periodic table. So the 4s actually behaves just the way we expect it to. Four, we're in the fourth row of the periodic table for calcium and potassium. So it's 4s2. And then we're in this D block. And even though it's in the fourth row of the periodic table, it still belongs to the third energy level. So we just, best, so we just have to go backwards one. So it's still 3D. And a d orbital can hold 10 electrons. Right? And so the and that's why it's 10 elements across this d block. And so it's a it's a little bit funky in that it's offset by one row on the periodic table. And all of the d orbitals are offset by one spot. So so for yttrium through cadmium. That's in the fifth row of the periodic table, but those correspond to the 4D orbital. All right, so you're just going to, for all of the D orbital um, electron configurations, you're just going to be off by, um, by one row. All right, so it's, it's a little bit finicky as to the way you actually follow the periodic table. It still follows our rules. We just had to add like a little clarification once we get to the d orbitals because the d orbitals make everything more complicated. <clears throat> All right. Questions so far? Um, what happens <clears throat> if we don't have a neutral atom? So we've looked at doing the electron configurations for sulfur and for zinc. If we're doing electron configurations for ions, that still doesn't really change our process. It just means it's changing the number of electrons we have to work with. So instead of, <clears throat> say, for sulfur, um, sulfur or sulfide with a negative 2 charge, well, sulfur would be ending right here at 16 electrons if it was neutral. But if it has a negative two charge, it has to gain two more electrons. We have two extra electrons if it's got a negative two charge. So we still follow our same rules. We just, when we get to sulfur, we don't stop there. We add the extra two electrons on. So the electron configuration for sulfur is actually the same as argon. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. Right, so the charges, just like with figuring out how many electrons you have to work with from the charges, the charges are modifying the um, number of electrons relative to the protons, right? Charges for electron configurations are just modifying the electron configuration by either adding extra electrons to fill an orbital or taking away electrons so that you have an empty energy level. Um, orbitals get and energy levels get more stable 
if they're either completely full or completely empty. So this is another way that the periodic table has a lot of information in it because you can just look at sulfur and say, okay, well, if I'm trying to get to either a full energy level or an empty energy level, I can either gain two electrons and then sulfur would look like argon or sulfur could lose six electrons to look like neon. Well, losing six electrons is a lot more work than just gaining two. We're always pretty much going to go in the, in the order of um, what is the fewest steps. So sulfur is going to gain two electrons to become more stable and become sulfide. Um, bromine, and I'll do these, we'll do bromine and bromide, the charged form on the board here for practice. Um, bromine is when it's neutral with a negative one charge, it's just going to have one extra electron. So if we wanted to write out those electron configurations, Um, we are going to, we'll, we'll do bromine first, and I'm going to minimize the periodic table. And you guys can follow along on your periodic tables. So for bromine, it's still going to start off the same way. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. Now we filled the first two rows of the periodic table. So we keep going. 3s2, 3p6. That finishes the third row of the periodic table, right? I'm going to go down to the next, the next row here. Um, now we're in fourth row of the periodic table. So it's 4s2. The d orbital is our weird one. So we, we're off by one. So we say 3d. 10, and we still have another five electrons to go to, to count over to bromine. So, and now we're back in the fourth energy level. So 4P5. All right, so I, a tip about these electron configurations, you will never duplicate the same the same orbital again. Once you filled up an orbital, you're not going to see it again in the same electron configuration. So if you forgot to flip back to 4p after you filled 3d, you would wind up with you might wind up with 3p and 3p. That should tell you that should be a red flag. You should never have the same orbital twice in the same electron configuration. And if we wanted to take this and get bromide, which is has the negative one charge, we just have one extra electron from where we were. So instead of being 4p5, it would be 4p6. Does zinc end up getting into the d orbital? It does. It's the end of the first d orbital, right? So we're going to do that one next. Um, I just wanted to also show you, so you guys can see how getting writing the first couple rows of the periodic table would get a little repetitive. Um, so if you're dealing with something with more than 18 electrons, you can actually use a shorthand to just say, um, OK, this is the last noble gas that I passed. This is the last energy level that I filled. And so you can, instead of writing, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, and then continuing on, you can say, okay, bromine's electron configuration is, then you have to use brackets and say it's argon, and then continue on as though you were starting right after argon. So then you could write 4s2, 3d10, 4p6. Right, so this is just for now. I don't want you to do this because I want you to get that 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6 drilled into your head. Um, and so I want you to be aware that this shorthand exists. But for now, I want you guys to practice writing all of them out um, while we get really comfortable with this. And then 
eventually the rule will, will go with is if it's more than 18 electrons, you're used, you're allowed to use this notation. Um, if, so looking at zincs, if we if we started from zincs electron configuration when it's neutral, zincs electron configuration when it's neutral, and we'll use that same short, I guess we'll write it out for right now. Different color. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. We're trying to get all the way to zinc. That's the first three rows. Then we would continue on and write 4s2, 3d10. So that's zinc as a metal, but zinc actually, when it's when it's charged, when it's an ion, actually has a plus two charge. And so a plus two charge means we have to take away two electrons. If we're trying to take away two electrons, we have two choices really. We're not going to take any of these red, these red ones away. Um, once we fill an energy level, it's super stable. And so we're never going to break up a full energy level. In fact, we're going to try to avoid breaking up full orbitals too. So our choices here, we can take away two electrons from 3D, since that was the last one we just filled up, but that would be breaking up a full orbital, which is, it's really stable once it's full. Or we can take away these two electrons from 4S. And if we take away the two electrons from the 4s orbital, now all we're left with is completely filled energy levels. We have the full um, n equals one, n equals two, and n equals three are all totally full. And the fourth energy level is totally empty. So for all, so even though we fill up the d orbital after the 4s, we're actually going to take these electrons away first. So the electron configuration for zinc when it's an ion is going to be all of these are still the same. So you have the electron configuration for argon. And then instead of taking away this and breaking it up and put making 3D8, we're going to take away those. So our electron configuration for zinc ions would just be argon and then 3D8. Sorry, 3D10. I just, I said 3D8 too many times. I confused myself. So it's just all of these still, and then 3D10. We're not, and here's, I, I very rarely use absolutes, but here's one. Never break up a full D orbital. If you have to take electrons away and you have a full D orbital, you're gonna take them away somewhere else you're not going to break up a full d orbital. And in general, that's we'll get into some of the exceptions in the transition. Transition metals in the d block are weird in general. There's some funny things that happen with the energy as you're filling up the d orbital. For this class, I'm not going to ask you about any partially filled d orbitals. Your d orbitals are either going to be full or empty. Right? So don't don't ever take away those any electrons once it gets filled. That's the, the takeaway there. All right, let me see what else we had on here. I think that's a pretty good intro to electron configurations. Go back to the screen share. <clears throat> All right, so there's now that we're starting to get a little bit more familiar with how orbitals work um, and how how electron configurations work, um, let's talk about some of the applications of that. Why does this matter? Well, for starters, it allows us to predict 
how elements are going to react based on what, what's called the number of valence electrons. And so valence electrons are just defined as Um, let me write this out in here for you. Are, are the electrons in the highest occupied energy level? Right, so if we're doing electron configurations, we actually have all the tools we need to answer these questions. Whatever is the highest energy level that has electrons in it, that's your valence level. And whatever, and so when we talk about how many valence electrons an element has, it's based, it's exactly what it sounds like. You're just going to count the electrons in that highest energy level. So for carbon, carbon's highest energy level is, is the second energy level. It has electrons in the first energy level, then it has electrons in the second energy level. And then the third energy level is still there, it's just empty for carbon. So the highest occupied energy level is, is n equals 2, is the second energy level. So if we want to know the valence electrons for carbon, we can find that by just counting how many electrons are in that second energy level. So the electron configuration for carbon is one s, two, two s, two, two s, or two p, two. Right, so the, the number of valence electrons is the electrons that are in that second energy level. So carbon has a total of four valence electrons. It's got 2s2 and 2p2. That's the highest occupied energy level. So those are your valence electrons. And you include both the s orbital and the p orbital because even though the p orbital is higher in energy, they're still the same overall energy level. They're still in the second row of the periodic table. And this also means that the shorthand, the easiest way to do this by looking at the periodic table, is you start in column one and you count over till you get to your element. So one, two, three, four. Counting from the left, carbon's in the fourth column. Therefore, it's the it has four valence electrons. And so the same approach works for the rest of these two. Carbon's going to have four valence electrons. Neon has a total of 10 electrons, eight of which are in the second energy level. So it has eight valence electrons. All right, and this, again, this is, this is tied to the electron configuration. And this is one of the reasons why everything in the same column on the periodic table reacts in a similar way. Because all of your noble gases are going to have eight valence electrons. All of your halogens chlorine, fluorine, bromine, iodine are going to have seven valence electrons, right? So the periodic table has this information built into it, which is why this is what's called a periodic trend. It's a, it's a property that if you know how to look at the periodic table, the periodic table contains this information. Uh, if we looked at aluminum, Aluminum, aluminum is, um, has 13 electrons when it's neutral. And the first 10 of which are not in its valence shell. Its valence shell is, is the third energy level. 
So aluminum has one, two, three valence electrons. All right, so now that we laid the groundwork with the electron configuration, these are pretty straightforward. These are maybe even easier than the um, than the electron configurations. <clears throat> I have a question. Yeah. Um, so I was I heard you say that all the noble gases will have the same amount of valence electrons. Um, and I'm just kind of confused because I would look at the periodic table and think like um, Krypton would have more than neon. I'm glad you brought that up because that ties to Alan's question about bromine and zinc as well. When, what happens when the d orbital gets involved, right? Okay. Um, so remember that the d orbital you're off by one by one row on the periodic table. So if I go back to the board here, let's look at zinc. Okay. Um, and because that, that will also answer your question for Krypton. And so let me go back and we'll put this one back the way it was. So zinc is a metal is as all of these full energy levels up to argon and then it's 4s2, 3d10. Okay. The highest occupied energy level is n equals four, right? Yeah. So not the last orbital that you fill, but the highest energy level. Okay. So so actually, even though these three d orbitals are is was higher in energy than the four s, the four s is still your valence level. So zinc only has two valence electrons. <laughs> because the 3D electrons don't count. They don't count at all when you're doing this. Okay. Not for valence electrons because they belong to that lower energy level. They belong to the third energy level and we're talking about the fourth oh, energy level. Okay, got it. That makes sense. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and that's the same for, for krypton and bromine, right? Anything that um, we can basically ignore that D block when it comes to counting valence electrons because they're, it's, they're off by a row. Um, and so that that also means that for the sake of this class, all all of the transition metals, everything in the D block, is going to be the same. They're all going to have um, two valence electrons in the D block, because and there there are some exceptions to the way it fills up, as I mentioned. But for the sake of this class, zinc, cadmium, mercury silver, copper, they're all going to only have two valence electrons because that's the energy level that we care about. All right, let me, that's what I wanted. Um, so it does also, however, beg the question, what happens when we lose those? If zinc loses two electrons, its number of valence electrons is going to change, right? So I just went to the screen share again, but I'm going to go back to the board. Um, if we lose those two electrons, if we had zinc, zinc ion, well, now we don't have those 4s electrons anymore. So we can either, there are two ways to sort of think about this. We emptied what was the valence level, right? So we could say as zero valence electrons, but that's not really true because valence, the valence shell is the highest occupied energy level. And so that just means that our valence level changed. We went from N equals four being the valence shell. to now our highest occupied energy level is actually three. And so for, for zinc, when it's an ion, you actually have to add up everything with a three in front of it. So when zinc is an ion, it actually is going to have a total of 18 valence electrons. 
because our valence level changed. We went from, from four being the highest level that we cared about. Now, once that fourth energy level is empty, we don't care about it anymore. Now our highest occupied energy level is 18, is N equals three, which has 18 electrons in it. Right, so the, when, I, when we talk about the valence shell or the valence energy level, it's always whatever is the highest energy level that has something in it. And that can change depending on if you gain or lose electrons sometimes. All right, just a, a little note about semantics and a way to remind yourself that we're not talking about any specific energy level, it's just whatever the highest level is that has electrons in it. Now I'll go back to the slides. All right, so, and we can count a lot of these. Um, phosphorus and nitrogen are, are both gonna be five. Um, lithium is going to be one. Sodium, when it's a metal, is also going to be one. It's the same column as lithium, right? Selenium, if, I, if you don't have that memorized where it is, it's in column 16 here. So if we count from the left over to selenium, one, two, skip the D block, three, four, five, six. So selenium has six valence electrons, just like sulfur, just like oxygen. All right, so there, there's a reason we spend so much time on why the periodic table is shaped like it is, is because it really has a lot of information to it, as I keep, I keep saying. All right, so questions on valence electrons. All right, then let's go to the next periodic trend. So um, a lot of times when we're talking about periodic trends, we mean that ways that we can use the periodic table to make generalizations or qualitative statements like, carbon has four valence electrons. And so a lot of times we're talking about um, which way does it increase, does a property increase? So as you go from left to right across a period on the periodic table, and a period is another way of saying row, across a row on the periodic table, your valence electrons is gonna increase. Unless you're in that D block, but Let's ignore that for now. The other one other useful trend to know about is it actually allows us to predict um, atomic radius as well. How big are the atoms? Because the, the size of an atom is due entirely to the number of electrons it has and the number of energy levels it has that are occupied, right? So when you, when you add an energy level, you're gonna make your atom take up more space. Um, and that's basically because the lowest energy orbitals are closest to the nucleus. And then as you add energy levels, they kind of build up and get further and further away from the nucleus. So it sort of makes sense. As you add more energy levels, things get bigger where it's a little counterintuitive is when you go from left to right in the same row, as you're adding electrons in the same energy level, you're not actually, you're not adding, you're adding electrons, but you're not adding any energy levels to it. And when you add electrons to the same energy level, the size actually doesn't get any bigger because the orbital still takes up the same amount of space, regardless of if it's got one electron in it or eight electrons. 
that it, you could think of it a little bit like having having an apartment building with only one one room rented. It doesn't matter that there's only one room rented, the building takes up just as much space, right? So when you go from left to right across the periodic table, you actually wind up with your atoms getting smaller. Because as we're adding electrons, we're also adding protons to the middle to the nucleus, right? And what do protons do to electrons? They pull on them. They attract them. Adding protons, a positive charge, positive charges attract negative charges, right? So the more you add protons for the same energy level, you're actually pulling those electrons in tighter and tighter as you go from left to right. So when you go down a, a row on the periodic table, you're making something bigger. You're adding a whole new building, to use our analogy. But when you go from left to right on the same row of the periodic table, your, your atoms actually get smaller because everything gets pulled in tighter by that nucleus. So it's a little bit like a typewriter. Your, your radius is going to decrease, 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 and then you're going to add a new energy level and it's going to jump up like a typewriter resetting. If you've never typed on a typewriter, don't worry, neither have I, but I've seen them in the movies. It's gonna make, it's like that, that sound it makes when it swings all the way back to the other direction. And so, let's see. Um, and I don't have the figure on here right now. Let me, let me look it up real quick. Uh, graph. Yeah, there we go. So if we look at this image here, I just want to see the image. There we go. As you go from left to right in the same row, things get smaller because that the nucleus is going to pull those electrons in tighter to it. Then all of a sudden you get to the end of an energy level. Once you've filled up that energy level, the next electron has to start a whole new energy level. So it jumps up and we have this discontinuity where it jumps up to the next energy level. These colors each represent different row on the periodic table. Blue, this greenish color is the second row of the periodic table. This is the third row of the periodic table, fourth row of the periodic table. And every time you fill up the energy level and start a new energy level, we see that jump, right? So going, adding an energy level makes things bigger. If you're talking about things that are in the same energy level, you look at how many protons they have compared to each other. More protons means it's gonna be smaller as long as we're talking about the same number of energy levels. Right, and so the way that, that, question, that uh, I ask questions about this is, is usually qualitative, like rank these, rank these um, atoms from largest to smallest. And those are always the two variables. How many energy levels do they have compared to each other? And how many protons do they have compared to each other if they have the same number of energy levels? All right, so um, we'll do a, I'm not gonna do this practice. We can, we can review these next week to go over some more practice for these, but I wanna get to the, um, to one of the calculation questions in particular. Um, ionization energy is the last trend we're going to look at for now. And an ion, ionization energy is, it's the amount of energy that it takes to pull an electron away from an atom. So the more tightly held the electrons are, the harder it is to pull an electron away. And so, 
Um, in general, what we're going to see is the more the higher energy level an electron is, the easier it is to take away from an atom. You can think of it just like the, it's tied to how big it is. The further away an electron is from the nucleus, the easier it is to take away because the nucleus is not holding it as tightly. And the same for as you go from left to right. When you get over close to the noble gases, those atoms have lots of protons in the nucleus. And so they're going to be holding the electrons tighter. So it's gonna be harder to take away electrons from something on the right-hand side of the periodic table compared to the left-hand left side. So if we look at the periodic table in the top right section, these are gonna be the, the elements with the highest ionization energy. These are the elements that it's hardest to take electrons away. And the bottom left is the easiest to take electrons away. Right, because there's more energy levels at the bottom left, and um, there's not as many protons it, as so. If we're comparing, say, barium compared to radon, they're both in the same energy level, but radon has extra protons, which means it's going to hold on to those electrons that much tighter. Right, so same logic really as. Um, as atomic radius. For both of them, we're looking at how many energy levels do we have and how many protons do we have. All right, and then I'm going to skip metallic character for now because that one's kind of trickier to, um, to define. It's a little bit more qualitative. Um, I'm also gonna skip talking about atomic, uh, We'll talk about this quickly. Um, atomic mass is has very odd units if you're talking about individual atoms, right? So if you were in lecture in lab on Monday, then you already heard me talk about some of this. So it should be a little bit review. But if you weren't, um, we can actually measure the mass of an individual atom, and it turns out it's really really small. The mass of a hydrogen atom is about 1.66 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. That's really small, right? So we don't actually ever measure things in terms of atomic mass units or AMU. So we actually have a very convenient number that was chosen for chemistry um, that allows us to count atoms in groups. Instead of talking about individual atoms, we talk about moles of atoms. Um, and a mole, not that kind of mole, moles are kind of like a dozen. This is the analogy that gets used all over the place. Um, so if you look up what is a mole, you're almost always going to say they're one of the first lines is going to be like, it's like a dozen, or it's a chemist's version of a dozen. Um, it's basically just a way of to count the number of an object. It doesn't matter what that object is, a mole of it is a certain number of it. Just like it doesn't matter um, what we're talking about, a dozen is 12 of that object, right? You can have a dozen chairs, you can have a dozen cupcakes. In either case, a dozen means 12 of that object. A mole of anything, is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd of that object. Right, and so this number allows us to use those atomic masses on the periodic table in a much more useful way. Instead of talking about things that are 10 to the minus 27 kilograms, we actually talk about the atomic masses as um, the weight per mole of an atom. So if you had an entire mole of an atom, how much would it weigh? That's going to be dependent on what atom it is. But again, and this is just an example, a mole of pens is 6.0 times 10 to the 23rd pens. 
right? It's just a, just a way of counting objects when we're dealing with a really, really large number of objects. And to give you an idea of how big a mole is, this, this number, which is also called Avogadro's number, um, a mole is a pretty good estimate for the number of grains of sand on the planet Earth. If you totaled up all, every single grain of sand on the entire planet, you would have about a mole of grains of sand. Um, so it's a huge number. It's why we don't count individual atoms because individual atoms are way, 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 way too small. Instead, we count by moles. And what that allows us to do is one, we can write a conversion for a mole of anything that'll allow us to Say, okay, well, if I have how if I have 1.45 moles of hydrogen, I can use that definition to actually get a number of hydrogen atoms. So I could say, okay, well, um, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd um, uh, hydrogen atoms is one mole hydrogen. So if we use that, not, not three, sorry, six. Must have just missed it on the number pad. All right, so this does allow us to actually calculate a number for how many atoms or how many molecules we're dealing with. But again, once you practice how this conversion works, you're never really gonna ever do that because we're never going to be dealing with individual atoms. Even when we're talking about something as small as, um, as a, a cell, a single cell, a single cell is still um, about a mole of atoms. And it's a little bit less than that, but it's a lot closer to a mole than it is to counting individual atoms. You're still talking about 10 to the 23rd, 10 to the 21 probably atoms in a cell, right? So we're almost always gonna be dealing in moles. And the other reason that this is useful is because those, those masses on the periodic table are actually, can be thought of in two different units. That's Avogadro's number was actually picked very carefully. Um, so, and it was based around how many atoms are in one gram of hydrogen originally. So um, one AMU per atom, so AMU are the, the official mass units on the periodic table are in AMU per atom. But it's really, really nice that that also can be written as grams per mole. So if you know how many grams of a substance you have, you can figure out how many moles of that atom you have. And I know I'm going fast on this and there's more detail on the lab video for this week. Uh, All right, so I'm going to, let's go ahead and we're gonna make an executive decision here. Um, we're going to take one problem off of the homework set. So I'm just, we're going too fast. I'm not gonna get a chance to show you guys in enough detail for you guys to do that problem. Um, so let me pull up the, the homework so I can show you exactly which problem, the isotopic mass or the mass of the individual isotopes, we're just not gonna get to it this week. So just to, just cross that problem off of the homework, um, which I think was the top of the second page, but let me pull up the assignment so I can double check that. It's the top mm, of yeah. the second. Yeah, so just, just cross off number three. 
we'll get to that one um, next next week. Um, I believe you have everything else you need here. Um, you might have to look up a few things to remind yourself we didn't really talk about ionic radius compared to atomic radius, but that is something that we can we use the same logic for um, when it comes to um, counting the number of energy levels and counting the number of protons in the nucleus. Um, so you should still be able to, to answer all the rest of these questions. So our last five minutes here, um, let's just talk about using the atomic mass to figure out how many moles you have of something. Right. And again, I go over some practice with this on the lab intro video too. Um, and I'll be back, I'll be in lab at four today. Um, so I'll be able to answer any questions that you guys have uh, at four in the lab, lab section to Zoom. So if we wanna know the mass or the mass and we have the number of moles of something, all we need is the periodic table to answer this because the units on the periodic table, the, the atomic mass on the periodic table of say gold, this mass number is in grams for every mole, grams per mole, which means this is a conversion that lets us convert from moles to grams or vice versa. So if all we have is the periodic table, for gold and we know we have 0.5 moles of gold to, to find the mass of half a mole of gold, we just say, okay, well, I have half of a mole of gold and every one mole of gold is 196 point, was it 97, I think? Right, what that, I'll go back to the periodic table so you can see where that came from. This mass number is in grams per mole. So it is a conversion the same way density is a conversion. These atomic masses are ways of converting from a mass to number of moles or vice versa. Right, so we'd wind up with moles canceling, moles of gold canceling out moles of gold. And our final answer would be in grams. If we wanted to go from grams of silicon into moles of silicon, we'd use the same sort of conversion. We would just, um, it would, we would look up silicon instead of gold. We, so we'd zoom out or find silicon. Silicon's mass is 28.09 grams per mole. So for every 28 grams of silicon, we have one mole. And so if we wanted to fill in our, our see if it'll let me do this without, um, yeah, this will work. So for every 28.09 grams of silicon, we have one mole silicon. So grams can silicon cancels out grams of silicon, we're left in moles of silicon. So because of the atomic theory, we care about how many individual, or not how many individual atoms, we care about the number of atoms in a compound, not just how many grams of something we have. So for instance, we, I can tell you that there's 16 grams of oxygen um, for every two grams of hydrogen in water. And that's cool and all, but what's more useful is knowing it's one oxygen atom for every two hydrogen atoms. The idea that we're comparing things in whole number ratios means we need them in moles. In other words, for every, in water, for every one mole of oxygen, you have two moles of hydrogen. Right, so getting to the moles of an atom or moles of a substance 
winds up being a really useful tool. And we'll see why, especially when we start getting into um, chemical reactions pretty soon. All right. So I know that that was a whirlwind and I went pretty fast over some of that. Um, I'll get the video uploaded later today. Um,